Hey everyone, Pastor Doug here, continuing with our study in Revelation. And uh, we're still in chapter 1 today, so if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version, uh, but uh, before we go, go ahead and, and jump in, let, let's pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you praising you worshiping you, glorifying you, because you deserve all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And as often as I pray this prayer, as often as I bring that to mind, Lord, it's not enough. It's never enough to, to, to refresh our memory and to remind us that every single thing, good, bad, and different that happens, happens because of your purposes and your sovereignty and your omnibenevolence. And so, since everything is playing out in your perfect plan, in your perfect way, Lord, we are to praise you and glorify you and worship you no matter what. And Father, I pray that as we continue this study in Revelation, Lord, that uh, our, our spiritual eyes will be opened and that we will get a supernatural illumination to the truth of this message. And that I would step out of the way and the words would be yours and that you'd be glorified in all of it as I've prayed. And I thank you and pray, praise you and worship you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, the judgment seat or the Bema seat of Christ is meant for us professing Christians, real and imperfect Christians. And it tells us that, that there are degrees of our future blessedness in direct proportion to our present faithfulness. You know, it's, it's Christians only that are in view here as we look at this passage, and all that we have hidden shall be revealed. And uh, the, the things we have done in the body are, are gonna come back to us, whether they're good or whether they're bad. Every reverent thought and every thought of sin, every secret prayer, every secret curse, every unknown deed of agape, and every hidden deed of selfishness, we're going to see them all again. And even though we've not remembered them for many years and perhaps have forgotten them altogether, we're going to have to acknowledge that they're ours. You know, that's got to be a solemn thing to stand at the end of our life at the Bema Seat of Christ. Daniel Webster once uh, said, My greatest thought is my accountability to God. May that always be our greatest thought and, and keeping that at the forefront of our minds and on our hearts as we go about our day, as we go about our life, as we make life choices, make life decisions. Folks, we need to realize and understand that King Jesus is bringing this message through the Apostle John as we look at the book of Revelation. And We've got to realize that the gravity of this message in Revelation is as weighty as John's reaction to seeing Jesus in his Shekinah glory. You know, the, the disciple whom Jesus loves, laying back on his breast, he sees Jesus and he faints. We're going to see that. And uh, as In the context of, of Revelation, as, as we look at Revelation, I know that many people have, uh, have looked at Revelation and they've come up with these four different ways to look at the, at the book of Revelation and so forth. But uh, for us, we're just going to read the text in the most normative way, in, in the most normative way that we would read any piece of, of literature. And, uh, you know, as we look at the historical components of the text, uh, it, it, the text says, to the seven churches, and of course they're located in the first century, in late first century in Western Asia Minor, there are churches that are real, they're there, and, and this letter is being directed to these churches. That's the way it's phrased, that's the way it's written. Just to look at uh, the, some of the cultural aspects of, of Revelation, it's very figurative in its language, and there's a lot of symbolism, a lot of uh, symbolic representations there, and we have to really understand some of these from the Old Testament. And of course, the culture would have easily recognized many of these things, but you know, for us, you know, 2,000 plus years later, it's a little difficult unless we go back to the original culture and take a look at some of the things that, uh, that they would have understood. 
I'm going to look at the grammatical component of the passages that we're studying because as we look at parts of speech, as we diagram sentences, as we, as we look at the structure of the passages, it's critical and important to interpretation to look at these things. And um, really the literary component that we need to understand that this is this book is, is prophecy. It's apocalyptic in nature. Revelation is a, an apocalypsis is, is what it's titled in the Greek. And it, apocalyptic literature, guys, it, it's a type of biblical literature that emphasizes the, the lifting of the veil between heaven and earth and the revelation of God and his plan for the world. Uh, apocalyptic writings are, are marked by distinctive literary features. And we have to look at those. We have to consider those as we interpret. Otherwise, we miss it. Uh, particularly the prediction of future events and certainly accounts of visionary experiences or journeys to heaven uh, that are often involving vivid symbolism. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in, and uh, I'll be reading beginning in, uh, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up the, the chapter, uh, chapter 1 of Revelation. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, hmm. to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs in his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. After, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the doing of his word. Go back with me, if you will, to the beginning of the passage there, and I want to look at the figures of speech that are being used here, when, uh, when he says, when the Apostle John says partner in the tribulation, that's really a metaphor for persecuted believers. So, uh, you know, of course, when, when John says that he's a partner in the tribulation, what he's saying there is that he also is, uh, is being persecuted, of course, being uh, uh, marooned on this island after they tried to boil him uh, and that didn't work. Uh, and the next thing that, that he uses uh, a metaphor is he says the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And of course, that's metaphorical for the Bible and for the gospel message. And when he says he's in the spirit, notice if you look in your Bible, hopefully it's uh, capitalized S, meaning the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think we need to delve deeper into that and just, think, and you just consider that he was just dominated and controlled by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit during this time. And uh, then he mentions that it's on the Lord's Day. And of course, that's just metaphorical for the day that Jesus rose from the dead, which of course we know is Sunday. When he says that his voice was like a trumpet, it wasn't a trumpet. There wasn't a trumpet coming out of his mouth and so forth, but his voice was like a trumpet. That's a simile for the sound that, that his voice made. And then uh, as he saw him, he says he saw someone, one like a son of man. Again, that's simile for a humanoid figure. 
And so uh, as he continues, he talks about the hairs of his head were like white wool. Again, that's a simile for the way that, the, that his hair looked. Eyes like a flaming fire. Again, a simile for the way that his eyes looked. Feet like burnished bronze simile. You know, his voice was like the roar of many waters. Again, a simile. Face like the shining sun, a simile. As though dead, simile. A lot of, lot of sim similes in this passage as John describes the way that Shekinah glory, Jesus, looks. But notice this, and you say, well, how do you know it was Jesus? Well, he, 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 he reveals that uh, at the, in the passage as we're, we're about to see. He says, I am the first and the last. And of course, that's metaphorical for eternality. In other words, when we say the first and the last, in other words, there was nothing before him, there's nothing after him. And there was, he has had, and we talked about this last week, he had no beginning, he has no end because he is eternal. There was no, beginnings are, are a creation. Of course, Genesis, that, that word, uh, the, the Hebrew word there means beginnings. Uh, and so the, the creation of beginnings is one of the, the creations and uh, so, so Jesus says, I am, you know, and of course, if we translate that into Hebrew, Yahweh, uh, the first and the last, this is a metaphor for eternality. But then we'll notice what he says next, the living one. And then he says, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. You see, he's describing himself as God the Son because, of course, God the Son, you know, Jesus had to be, uh, he had to be God to be perfect and he had to be man so he could die. And he describes himself as the first and the last, as God. He also describes himself as that one that gave his life, that, that, that shed his blood on the cross as the satisfaction of the wrath of God the Father against sin as atonement for your and my sin. And, uh, you know, when he says, the living one, I died, and behold, I'm alive again forevermore, that is a figure of speech for, for Jesus' actions of salvation, of, of the actions that he took in order to bring salvation to humanity. And uh, notice, and then the next thing that he says is that I have the keys to death and Hades. And friends, that's just a metaphor for sovereignty over the outcome of all things. You see, Jesus Christ, God the Son, is God. And he's sovereign over all the outcome of all things. So what, what's going on here? Well, uh, when this is happening, well, the, the, the text says, uh, back in, in verse 9 and, uh, and through 10, it's during John's exile on Patmos, while he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And of course, it's on the island of Patmos while he's in the Spirit. And John addresses his audience, identifying himself as the brother, as their brother, in Christ and, and partner in the tribulation and, and the kingdom. So, of course, the audience are believers. You know, of course, as we read the Bible, you know, the natural man does not understand these things. They're foolishness to him because they're spiritually discerned. And so uh, the audience of, of Revelation needs to be believers. You need to be a, a regenerated Christian, a, an indwelled believer, so that the Holy Spirit can illuminate you to the truth of what's being said here. So, John explains that, that he's on the island of Patmos as a result of his testimony in Christ. And so as he explains, he is being persecuted. That's a, that's a persecution. Now, of course, you know, we here in 21st century America, we don't experience that kind of persecution. We don't get uh, boiled in oil. We, we, we don't get uh, put to death with the sword. We don't get stuck into uh, the Colosseum with, uh, with, with wild animals to tear us to shreds or have molten lead poured down our throat or, or get exiled to, to, to the island of Patmos because they failed all of these things with John. Uh, but we do experience some persecution, you know, as, uh, as those, those hypocritical Christians, you know, and we always, we always get called hypocrites, you know, because, uh, of course, uh, the expectation or the, the belief, uh, you know, from, from, from the lost is that, that Christians are, are godly people and we never do anything wrong. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, we, we can't be mean to anyone and we, we have to be accepting of everything. We have to be a doormat and, and, and so forth. And there's just this lack of perception of what agape love really is. You know, when you talk about delivering truth and love, you know, if someone is destined for the lake of fire and you don't tell them, that's pretty unloving. You know, so I mean, you know, when, when someone's committing sins that are infraction against the, the, the living God, 
you know, we don't tell them, then that, that's, that's unloving, you know. But of course, we have to earn the right to speak into people's lives. And I think often Christians, uh, you know, we get this, uh, this idea of holier than thou, and we point fingers uh, at people when three fingers are pointing back at us, which is really why we get called hypocrites in the first place. But John's being persecuted uh, in a way that, uh, that has separated him. But interestingly, it provides this opportunity for Jesus to come visit him while, while John's in the spirit, so John says he was in the spirit, big S, uh, pneuma is that word, on the Lord's day when he heard this voice that sounded like a trumpet behind him. And of course, the voice commands him to write the letter that is now called Revelation or Apocalypsis. And so John's supposed to address the letter to the seven churches. Notice how that's phrased. Notice how Jesus phrased that and how John writes that down, addressed the letter to the seven churches, and then he names them, and they're existing at this time, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those are actual churches that are in existence during the first century, and he's addressing this letter to them to send it to them. So it's not symbolic of, of these church ages and so forth. And as I mentioned last week, and we'll see this over and over again, a lot of the things that, uh, that these churches are being accused of, we can, we can be accused of all of them, you know, in, in various places, different churches. Uh, so it's not like there was, well, this was the age of Ephesus and this was the age of Smyrna. No, it's, it, it's, it's just not kind of how things work, guys. But anyway, look, look at verse 20 with me. So, um, who are the seven angels of the seven churches? So Jesus now explains one of the mysteries of the book, the, the meaning of the stars and the lampstands. Of course, the lampstands uh, is understandable enough. Uh, they represent the seven churches named in today's passage. Uh, you know, and of course, as we look at metaphorical language and symbolic language, we've got to really take into consideration sometimes we have to go back to the original culture in order to understand these things. But this is pretty straightforward, and Jesus, of course, uh, helps us by explaining that. But as he goes on, the explanation of the seven stars raises more questions because, you see, a lot of times as we look at the Bible, um, stars are either actual stars or sometimes they, are, they refer to angels. Um, but these, these are the angels of the seven churches. You know, and some people say, okay, well, you know, there's an angel that's assigned to each church. Well, you know, I don't really see anything proving that in any scripture. And uh, just more likely, um, you know, when it says these are the angels of the seven churches, how are we to understand these angels uh, of the seven churches? I mean, they're, they're as mysterious as, uh, as the seven spirits of God that we see in, in, in verse 4 with whom they're kind of somehow associated. And, you know, as we get down to, to chapter 3, I think, um, I think we'll see a little bit more clarity on there. But some dispute whether the angel of each church refers to a heavenly being like a guardian angel or to an earthly messenger. You know, uh, that, that Greek word, angelos, uh, simply means messenger. So, hmm, interestingly, like a pastor or, or a bishop, a messenger. So in each of the letters that follow, the angel uh, of each church is addressed as the recipient. So uh, since these angels no doubt are expected to pass along the church's information communicated to them by Christ, you know, it's likely that they must be visible human messengers in contact with, with the congregations. And so as I, as I tease that out, as I actually look at what the text says, uh, I got to believe that the communication between God and his heavenly angels is more direct than through letters posted by apostles. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at this, you know, as those angels of the church is uh, as the pastor, you know, or, or uh, um, uh, just, uh, you know, a, a leader, uh, elder. So next, John turns around to see who's speaking to him. This is, this is huge. Y'all. I mean, he, he turns to see seven gold lampstands. In the middle is one like a son of man. Of course, that's that human form. And John describes the nature of the figure who is speaking to him. And so in the figure's right hand, okay, there's, there's an importance there. A right hand, you know, that's a symbol of power, are the seven stars. Interesting, interesting. So if those pastors, if those seven stars are in the right hand of God, then God has power over them, right? 
and his mouth is a two-edged sword. So, so John faints when he sees this figure. And of course, the figure revives John with his touch. And he identifies himself as the first and the last, which of course is God. No beginning, no end, no one before him, no one after him. And he clarifies that he died, but is forevermore. So, so he is Jesus. He's God the Son, as I mentioned. You know? And so Jesus commands John to write the things that he has seen, those that are, and those that are to take place. Folks, this is figurative for past, present, and future events. So this is the gamut. It's covering the whole gamut of all of history, all of history of this, of this existence. So Jesus interprets what the seven stars and lampstands represent uh, as the seven angels of the seven churches. So uh, just to review, John explains that he's been instructed to write the seven churches of Asia about the revelation that has come to him through Jesus Christ as initiated by God the Father through his angel in order to usher in the return, the second coming of Jesus. And then the second part there, you know, Jesus appears to John in what's come to be known as his Shekinah glory in order to instruct John in the composition of a letter to the seven churches that are listed in the text. So let me give us a takeaway, some, something to walk away with uh, based on what we've, we've read today. Um, William Wilberforce, Christian statement, statesman of, uh, of Great Britain in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, once said this. He said, I must secure more time for private devotions. I've been living far too public for me. The shortening of private devotions starves the soul. It grows lean and faint. Following a failure in Parliament, he remarked that his problems may have been due to the fact that he spent less and less time in his private devotions, in which he could earnestly seek the will of God. He concluded, God allowed me to stumble. Have you stumbled? How's your, how's your quiet time? Do you have a daily quiet time? Do you have a time where whether you, you give God the first fruits of your day or, or toward the end of the day, whether you're a morning person or an evening person, where you, you and God get some time alone and you let him speak to you through his word and you let it wash over you and uh, transform you and, and prayer time, lifting up to God praises and prayers. So in a, in a letter to his friends, the hymn writer Wendell P. Lovelace relates this story. One evening, a speaker who was visiting the United States wanted to make a telephone call. He entered a phone booth, but found it to be different from those in his own country. It was beginning to get dark, so he had difficulty finding the number in the directory. And he noticed that there was a light in the ceiling, but he didn't know how to turn it on. As he tried again to find the number in the fading twilight, a passerby noted his plight and said, Sir, if you want to turn the light on, you have to shut the door. To the visitor's amazement and satisfaction, when he closed the door, the booth was filled with light and he could soon locate the number and complete the call. You know, in a similar way, when we draw aside in a quiet place to pray, we got to block out our busy world and open our hearts to the Father. Our darkened world of disappointments and trials will then be illuminated. We'll enter into this communion with God and will see and sense his presence, and will be assured of his provision for us. You know, our Lord often went to be alone with the Heavenly Father. You know, God the Son, if he's communing with God the Father, far be it from us not to do the same. Sometimes it was after a busy day of preaching and healing. At other times, it was before making a major decision. How are we doing with that? So here's my challenge. You know, if and I pray that you have a daily, a daily quiet time. I pray that you have that. That you be in prayer to prepare your heart and your mind for the message of Revelation as it applies to us in anticipation of Jesus' return. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your message and your purposes to your glory. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Empty us of ourselves. Help us to seek you. Help us to seek audience with you. Give us the energy and, and the desire and the drive and the passion to spend time with you in prayer and meditation. 
letting your word wash over us, Lord. Fill us with your spirits. We can accomplish your purposes. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll see you next time.